Well, thanks all for coming. Uh, we're here today to talk about flexibility, and especially when flexibility backfires. Um, it does backfire, if you're wondering. That's why I didn't even put a question mark. Um, this talk is mostly based on some of the experience I've had using Smalltalk and hitting my finger through it and using it every now and then. Um, before we get started, well, let's look at flexibility and what flexibility means. Uh, flexibility, if you think about it in terms of anatomy, you can think that my joints are flexible, which is why I can move my arms, I can bend my um, elbows, I can probably knee down and tie my shoelace because I'm that flexible. Um, but if you look at it more in an engineering view, you're probably looking at something um, more technical. Wikipedia puts it quite well, I'm saying that it refers to designs that can adapt when external changes occur. And if you work on an application that interacts with something else you don't have control over, you're always going to be facing external changes and you have to be able to adapt quickly. Depending on the market you're in or the environment you're in, you have more or less time to adapt to those changes. Um, now, flexibility is kind of a big word and we can't really have one definition that matches everyone's need and everyone's use of flexibility. So the first step is to actually know your flexibility. Now what do I mean by knowing your flexibility? Well to know you know your flexibility, the first step is understanding it. If you can understand the flexibility then you're able to use it. It works for most things actually, but if you understand something you're able to use it. Same goes with flexibility. So that's great. If you're a one-man shop and you can understand your flexibility, you can use it. Um, if you're too much up or more, you need to be able to explain it so that the other guys can also use it and also know the flexibility. So that's the second step. If you're able to explain it, then you're able to share your view of flexibility and how you're using it and share it with others and have others use it in a similar way. Finally, you can even go further and visualize it. And if you visualize it, you can explain it to people that are kind of wider circle, not necessarily just your co-workers, but also your managers, your senior managers, um, clients, and so on. Now, flexibility also, you need to look at it on different levels. So, I've put three there. Uh, the first one is a technical level, which is, to me, we come as the kind of natural level I look at as a developer. I kind of look at how does flexibility impact my implementation of a solution. And how does it impact my code generally? Um, so that's that's the first consideration you need to have, looking at how you're using it in your code, how it works in your environment, kind of restricted to, to your application. Um, you can also look at it more from an architectural point of view. So if you're an architect, you know that you can't just consider the code you're looking at, you're probably looking at kind of more long-term solutions and how your code is going to move over time, how it interacts with the other applications you have to, to live with in your environment. So from that point of view, your flexibility, you're going to have a different view. You need to be able to see um, how flexibility fits into your kind of architectural views for, you, for the application you're working on in the project. Uh, finally, you need to look at it from a political point of view, for lack of a better word. Um, so that's more kind of explaining how flexibility fits in to, your, to the strategy of your team, of your project, your department, your company, how it fits with how you want to be viewed in your market, in your environment, all those things. So that's a, kind of knowing your flexibility. Now, if you don't know your flexibility, or if you want to see how I discovered the flexibility is, the, the question I ask myself is where to be flexible, when to be flexible, how to be flexible. Um, if you just start being just using flexibility anywhere in your application, especially because Smalltalk gives you so much, it's just going to end up being an absolute mess and you have no idea what you're doing and, and you can't understand it, you can't explain, you can't visualize, you probably don't want to explain. Um, but if, if you look at it in terms of where, you can start thinking of where do, I, where do I want to be using flexibility? Do you want to be flexible with your interactions with other applications or do you want to be flexible inside your application, you want to be flexible for your developers to develop your application or for your users to use the application 
Uh, do you want to be flexible when you're debugging directly, or do you want to be flexible when you're prototyping? All those things you have to consider, and depending on the answer you come up with, you're going to have a very different view on how you let the flexibility fit into parts of your system. Um, another question is when to be flexible. You don't necessarily want to be flexible all the time. There's, there are times when it's good to be flexible, times when it's not that good. Um, one example could be if on, on a Monday morning you come in and your application is throwing error messages and your users are a bit annoyed because they're not able to use the application anymore and you start looking at it and you realize that an upstream system is sending you extra characters in every line they send and that's wrong. They just made a race over the weekend and your application is flying over because of it. So your usual answer is to pick up the phone, call your team say, well, listen man, you need to fix your application. And they can tell you something like, yeah, sure, Bob, fix it, done. Or they'll say, well, we need to get a senior manager who's actually on holiday to sign it off. So it's going to take another two hours to get him on the phone. And we need to bounce all our servers, and that takes about 16 hours. So we could probably get the fix by Wednesday morning. And if, you're, if your users are very patient, you can probably live with it, but um, in the market I work, they're not waiting 16 hours for something to happen. Um, so, they're, so what you can think is, well, I'm flexible, I can fix it in 10 minutes, I can build a new version of my app in 30 minutes, I can get all the sign-off done in 10 minutes, and I can have it released in the next hour. And so great, you can be great flexible, you know, your problem is solved in less than an hour. And then a big email gets sent out to everyone to say, well, there's a new version of application X. And every time this happens, you're always the one fixing the system, and you always send out an email saying, well, there's a new version of application X. And you get, and people keep on getting emails from, there's a new version of application X. So they think, oh, those guys are so flexible. But actually they don't. They, they probably think more, those guys must really suck, because they're releasing an application every half hour. So they must really have a serious problem in their application. Um, so this is kind of an example of when you would not be flexible. You would rather say, well, it's not our problem. They can, they can fix it out. We just take the hit. Um, you, also, you also need to think about how you're going to be flexible. Um, again, small talk lets you, be, lets you use things that you shouldn't really be using in other languages. I think there was a workshop by Uppsala some time ago called Special Superpowers. And you kind of, sometimes you can, you can be the superhero of small talk, sometimes you can be a really bad villain. And uh, you, can, you can do something like this, because I was writing code and I, I'm sure it's the third instance variable, but I just can't remember how I named it. I, my code is so flexible that instead of opening a new browser, I'm just going to say, oh yes, because I'm pretty sure it's the third one. And that works. You can put that in your code, and that's extremely flexible. You can rename the instant variable. You don't even have to change your code. <laughs> you, can, you can drop the whole RB thing. It's amazing. Now, obviously, if you add another variable in front of it, that's not going to work. Or if a superclass adds a variable, that's also going to break. But this is the kind of flexibility that you can use, and it's not necessarily the flexibility you want to use. Um, so you, you need to think of how you want to be flexible. If you, I mean, you can look for sentences of that in your application. Maybe you'll have a bad surprise. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's that's the kind of thing you need to to, to think about um, how you want to be flexible and where you want to restrict it. Now, talking about flexibility is is a good thing, but you need to look at the other side. And what is it when you're not flexible? Um, so I would like to put forward that when you're not flexible, you're strict. You're not strict in the sense that you're rigorous, which would mean that flexible means that you're not rigorous. It means that you're strict in the way that you have rules and you, you have to abide by those rules, whereas when you're flexible, you can kind of work your way around the rules. As a Frenchman, I'm really good at working my way around rules. That's what we do for a living, basically. And we, we always do this all the time. Um, being strict is more like you have to cross at the pedestrian crossing. Exactly. Um, so when you're when you're looking at your application, you're always, you always have a part of flexibility, a part of being strict. Now you're never going to have 100% flexibility. You're not going to have 100% strict. You can get pretty close to 100% strict, 
but you don't necessarily want to do that. And that's what systems like probably an application written in C++ would be more towards a strict side. You have to be sure your code compiles before you can build it. You have to be sure that this and that works before you can do it. Um, small type, you can say, well, I can accept my code, so it's probably working, right? And then you can just run it, and if it works, if it breaks, you just debug it as you go along, and then it works. Um, but you need to find a good balance in your application, and then depending on what aspect of your application you're considering, you need to see if you want to be strict or flexible in that part. Um, I was thinking yesterday when I had done my slides already that I could have done some kind of spider graph. You show like inputs and database connections, debugging, and you can have a kind of graph of your scale from strict to flexible for every aspect, and you can kind of see where your application fits in, and where you want it to be flexible, where you don't want it to be. Um, but because you're always going to be kind of somewhere in the middle, um, there's a few pointers I wanted to share of things that I found very useful in dealing with these issues. Um, so the first thing I did, also to be very flexible, is to implement strict output format. Now this comes after I got my fingers burned doing a change, thinking, well, it's an easy change, I'll get it done. And no one will even notice I did the change, and, well, a few weeks later, people couldn't send emails anymore, so they kind of didn't notice the change was, went through. Um, what happened is that one of our servers was getting decommissioned, and part of the services it was running was a mail server. So I said, well, we'll just switch to another mail server did the change, put in the next version of the application and rolled out and then people couldn't send emails anymore. What's happening is that we were pretty flexible in a way we allowed people to build emails. People could build an email with a from field that would be for. It wasn't a valid email address, it was just a string. And our mail server didn't care, so we just said, yeah, whatever, I'll send it. But the new ones did, and so they always they sent uh, an SNTP error back saying, well, you can't send an email if you don't have a valid from field. Um, now, I could of course have told all the users to say, well, from now on, you need to change all your emails and always add at domain.com at the end of it. But what I figured would be easier is to maintain the flexibility inside the application. I would add strict output so that I'm sure I please the strict requirements of the mail server, but I maintain my internal flexibility so my users can still just write full bar for the from mail. So from an implementation point of view, you just hook into when you send your mail, just check if it's a real email address, if not, just whack a domain in there and it works. I did use the actual regex for checking it's a valid email address because I, I read it and I couldn't sleep for a few nights. It's terrible, it's really long and it just added more complexity, so I just check if it's not a real domain and I just add it. But it does a trick. And it works pretty well. On the other side, um, something you can do is flexible input. Because you don't want to be strict with other people, but you might need to be strict when you, when you speak with other people. You don't necessarily want to impose people being strict when speak with you. Um, so, again, I've got an example here and something I broke. Um, we have a lot of automated test systems that will post um, defects to your bug tracking system when they get raised. And we just use a SOAP API, we just build the object, just throw it through, and then again, it raises a thing on the other side, you get an email confirmation. And one day we started getting error reports that it wasn't working anymore. So I found that there was illegal characters being pushed in. I didn't even know there were illegal characters for SOAP, but well, they were all being escape rate, but it seemed the bug tracking system on the other side had decided otherwise. And you had a few characters you did not accept. Um, so looking at it, I found that the problem was that we were getting a stack trace back from an external library we were calling. And their version was, they were giving us characters that were illegal for our bug tracking system. So I called the guys and said, well, can you fix it? You know, can you make a new version of your application when you're not putting all those crappy characters in there? They said, yeah, sure, we'll look at it. And an hour later, we're still looking at it. And a day later, oh, well, we can't really find where those characters are coming from. So I figured that we probably need to fix it on my side instead. And so what I did to fix it was actually go back to straight output format to say, well, I'm just going to filter out on the output side what I'm changing. Now, this also allowed me to remain flexible on the input because I could say, well, you can give me whatever you want because I can deal with it. And then I'm not going to impose the fact that my bug tracking system is strict on a system downstream to say, well, 
when you talk with us, you can't give those characters because we talk with that guy and he doesn't understand it. It doesn't really make much sense. So that kind of helps well. Um, I've used it in a few other places and it does allow you to, to maintain um, a good flexibility in your application, in your code, because you don't necessarily mind having those kind of invalid characters in, in, in the objects you're, you're sending around and just filter it at the end. Now, the biggest pointer I've found is this one. Be comfortable with what you're doing. Because obviously, if we go back to the self or at put, it's, it is flexible, um, but you're not necessarily comfortable having senders of that everywhere in your code. You don't necessarily want to have um, people saying, well, instead of implementing methods, I'm just going to have a real long does not understand and just have a ton of branches depending on the symbol of the selector and the message. And it also works. I've tried it. And it's not that it's not really fast, but it does it does work. It avoids writing a lot of methods. You can just keep it over the one big window and it looks like a big Java file on the end. Um, but you have to be comfortable with what you're doing because if you're using flexibility to a point that when people look at the code they can't touch it anymore or you're too scared of making a change to add a feature or fix a bug, then that's when flexibility backfires because you can go bragging along about how small talk is great and flexible and lets you do all this and do all that. And you say, well, can you fix that bug? You say, well, actually, no. Because if I fix it, I'm too scared of what's going to happen because <laughs> my system is so flexible. So you kind of have it come backfire at you and that, you really don't want that. So make sure that when you're using it, you're comfortable with what you're doing and you're also comfortable with um, how you're going to understand it, how you're going to explain it, how you're going to explain it to others and on all, all the different fields. And that's the main key. But the, the thing is, sometimes you're actually comfortable doing it. I mean, I'm very comfortable just concatenating straight from doing compiler evaluate blah and just evaluate it on the fly. It, it works fine. I, I use it in a few places and I'm very comfortable using <coughs> Inflor at put um, every now and then just for the sake of it. And, but even if you're comfortable, you need to be sure that you're being reasonable. It's not because you can that you must. It would have been a bit a weird presentation if you were started by, yes, you must. <laughs> and have the, kind of, the commandments of, in small talk, you have to have at least four or five overrides of this method and this and that. You can, you can do it. And there's a lot that you can do, but there's very little that you must do. That's a great thing about it, is that you don't have to think it all the way through. You can just figure it out as you go along. Um, so, be reasonable. I think that's it. I've lost track of time, so I don't know. I must be really short. based on the configuration of the application. So we could have a method called defined or you know print timestamp and then based on the configuration you add underscore London and then underscore second floor underscore third desk. And you can and then you end up having all those selectors that you're not actually sending anywhere, you don't know if they still work. You have no idea what they do, and they just get called because you, later on you're finding the code that you have yourself print string is doing a concatenate a bunch of stuff and doing self-perform law as string, and it just returns that, and you have no idea what. I mean, you're looking at something you don't even know what it is. So that's that's the kind of example that it is very really flexible. You don't have you can do it, but it's not really great when you have to come back looking at it a few years later. What's the difference between being generic and being flexible? Um, that's a tricky question. Between what? Being generic. Yeah. Yeah. So the difference between generic and being flexible. Um, I'm not too sure. Um, being generic is having something 
that works for every scenario. Being flexible is having something that can adapt to every scenario. So you've got, I think being generic is still being very strict. Because it means that, well, all my classes implement this method, so I can just send it to everyone. Like print string, for example, you just send that to nearly everyone in the system, and it's going to work. Um, being flexible is that, well, if you send print string and then I get an error back, I'm actually going to try sending a string. If I send a string and I get an error back, then I'll do something about it, or just send a string back so you cannot print. something that you kind of feel on, on the long run. So if you're doing the kind of strategic um, bug fixing, you get the phone rings, you have a bug, you produce a fix, you send it out. You're not really thinking of <coughs> how is this going to maintain, how is, you don't really care. I mean, if you're debugging something and you realize that, oh, they didn't implement an accessor on this other object, you just say, well, blah, it's the right put, and you just do it. Because you need it, that's what you're doing. Now you don't necessarily want to write the method, does it? But you can use it. So that's the. Now if you actually do the method and kind of keep it along for a while, especially if you no comment about why you did it, then that's where the cost is going to start. Because the first fix is quick because you just use flexibly, you use all the tools you have available. And the second fix is a bit slower because you have to spend half an hour figuring out what the previous guy did, and then the third fix is going to be even slower because you have to figure out what the previous two guys did, and so on. So you kind of, because you're being so flexible, you kind of have this increased time of understanding your sol the, the previous solution to the problem. Especially on a big system where a lot of people, changes will go in that you, you're not necessarily aware until you actually see the change on another day. I guess it's more more a comment than a question, but uh, I, I in my day-to-day -day work I more often run into the situation that uh, the code is much too flexible and much too strict. So I guess it's uh, something that uh, is a big problem in IT that people always or programmers often try to write flexible code when there is no need to do that. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would agree with that. Um, we added something, we did uh, an experiment the other day, which is quite fun, and we started with logging trapped errors in the system. And we did it, and then we couldn't read it in the log files anymore because they were too big. And that's, you, you find them everywhere. It's just, you're so flexible that you're not, your error never, your system never errors anymore. It's just that you have no idea what's going on under the hood because it's being caught and processed and handled and done this and done that and when you try actually putting a breakpoint in it well you end up that you actually never hit that method in the first place but it got handled somewhere else or so that's the there is a big risk of being too flexible. Being strict has its upsides. If you I mean if you error right away you see directly what the problem is. 